below there. We're going to be inviting you to use that during the talk tonight. So I um, wanted to make sure you have that accessible. Okay, Carrie Mangelusa is going to start us off. And we're going to go ahead and begin the program. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us tonight virtually. Um, hopefully sometime soon we'll be able to, you know, all convene at the Palmer again in the future. But I think the virtual format is a nice time for people who are even outside of State College to participate. Um, so thank you for coming to Art After Hours. Uh, we're going to start right now with our museum conversation on museums and the myth of neutrality. Um, and I would like to give a little intro to our team. Um, after briefly mentioning that our sticker party that starts at 7 p.m. is going to be at a different Zoom link. Um, so we're gonna post that in the chat and we'll also have the link on a slide um, once we conclude our conversation. Um, but for our team, I'm Carrie Mangeluzzo. I'm a graduate assistant at the Palmer and a PhD candidate in art history. Um, I've worked at the Palmer for a number of years um, since being at Penn State. And we're joined by Brandy Breslin, our museum educator. Um, I've known Brandy since undergrad um, when I went to the University of Florida and worked at the Harn there. So over 10 years, it seems like. Um, so I don't know, Brandy, if you want to say hello. Hello again, I'll be back. <laughs> and we're also joined by two of our fabulous interns. We have Tess Dubler, who's a junior majoring in art history. Hi, everyone. Um, and also Uchenna no uh, Wodum, who is a senior double majoring in political science and art history, um, also another intern. Hi, everyone. Um, and with that, I'll pass it over to Brandy. Thank you for getting us started, Carrie. And we do hope you'll be able to stick around for the sticker party. As Carrie mentioned, we do have a separate Zoom link that we'll put in the chat in a little bit so that you can head over there um, to continue the Art After Hours activities. So I wanted to start, um, well, actually, I want to just make sure that you know about some of these other upcoming programs uh, that the museum has planned for the fall. This is our series of museum conversations that will be taking place via Zoom. And they all are organized around a sort of a theme of, you know, behind the scenes look at museum work. And um, the dates and schedule are as follows. And I hope that you'll be able to join us for many of these. Another one of them, like tonight, is being sort of um, paired up with our Art After Hours program. And that's the one coming up on Thursday, October 29th, so in about a month. And the theme for that entire Art After Hours is around uh, like Halloween at home. So, um, so please join us. We'll try to make that one a little bit more especially fun. Um, and in particular, looking at what's you know, lurking, so to speak, in the museum crypt, which is a play on Halloween, but the museum art storage. All right. Uh, other programs that we have that we hope you'll join us for are the um, are both online. Um, the online art club is sort of a continuation of our summer museum sketchbook video series. And that's continuing with our online art club team who are actually the folks that are hosting the sticker party with us tonight. Um, those videos you can find on our YouTube channel, channel the Palmer YouTube channel. So please um, take a look if you're interested in kind of getting inspiration for you know creativity at home. We also have by this team here, Carrie, Tess, and Uchenna, the Palmer in Your Pocket, which is a great sort of social media light bites videos um, with interesting art facts, trivia, um, highlights, food for thought, and things like that. So do join the Palmer social media to keep up to date while we're um, still working remotely. All right, for tonight's talk, um, Museums and the Myth of Neutrality, I wanted to kind of set the stage a little bit on how this program came about and my thinking on this. And um, I wanted to definitely mention this hashtag of museums are not neutral. Really, this was the impetus um, for the talk tonight because this hashtag, ha excuse me, hashtag has been, you know, around for a few years. In fact, it was originated in 2017 by a couple of museum um, people. I, one was an educator, Mike Borowski, and the other is um, 
we believe a PhD candidate who's been working in museums, Latonya S. Autry. And, you know, this hashtag came about as a way to kind of connect a conversation online about museums and that museums are not neutral, um, even though there is sort of this concept that they are, that they, um, you know, don't sort of participate in the political fray, so to speak. And um, so this hashtag really was looking at exposing that myth as a way to, you know, create change in the museum field. And um, the organizers actually have done a project to make t-shirts. You can see on the screen, the Museums Are Not Neutral t-shirts. Carrie has a mug that she's sporting tonight. And, um, and they raised money really to help support social justice organizations. And most recently, I believe that they helped support um, during many layoffs in the museum field due to COVID closures, they help support relief funds for museum workers. So they're really, you know, doing some great work. Um, and I think that it had a lot, this hashtag had a lot more sort of energy, sort of refresh it this summer in the wake of George Floyd's death, when really so many of us culturally were beginning to, you know, see that um, what, you know, we've been doing so far is not enough. What can we do individually? You know, what actions can I take? Really sort of searching for what we could do. And so one thing that I felt like, you know, it's completely within my power to do very easy is to create a program and to really start the conversation in my, in real life community about museums are not neutral rather than just kind of participating in it online, which is how I had been doing so far. So, um, so I do wanna mention that the program tonight, our aim is to have this be the beginning of a conversation at the Palmer with staff and our, you know, our visitors and patrons, our community um, in order to help create change that we'll all be, um, sort of more satisfied uh, with the change towards equity, diversity, and inclusion. And to kind of help set the stage a little bit more, we wanted to talk about history of museums. And Carrie has prepared some comments on that to sort of set the stage for how museums are not neutral. Yeah, thanks, Brandy. Um, we thought it would be important to kind of lay the groundwork for a general history of museums and kind of how the museums that we know them as today came to be. Um, and I thought a fun way to do that is to pull in this, this reference to the film Black Panther. Um, I have a still here from the film um, with one of the main characters uh, played by Michael B. Jordan. And he finds himself, well, he, you know, hence, he heads over to this fictitious museum. I think it's referred to as the Museum of Great Britain that's supposed to reference the British Museum. Um, and he's in search for an object that is made of an extremely powerful material. Um, and it just so happens that this object is uh, an object of African art. I believe it's a pickaxe of some kind. Um, and he has an encounter with a white curator who specializes in African art, during which he confronts her about the colonial circumstances of looting that account for how the objects in the gallery got to where they are. Um, in the very seat of the former British Empire. Uh, this scene also illustrates the experiences of many Black visitors in museums today as it addresses even the surveilling of Black bodies in these institutions. You can notice the white security guard just off to the left. Um, but I think we can start to talk about things that this scene gets wrong about museums as well. Brandy and I had those conversations earlier that it would be a great idea for a program um, to talk about how films represent museums. Um, but to put it plainly, I think it gets quite a bit right. Um, and the fact is that museums share a history with colonialism, um, that a lot of collections and museums like the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the British Museum, they have artifacts um, from distant cultures because of their colonial enterprise. Um, we have a, you know, a catchy phrase, history is written by the victors. Um, but also those victors are conquerors and colonizers. Um, and the museum age that really boomed during the 19th century really coincides with that age of imperialism, of empire. And many scholars have written about the ways that museums functioned as tools of empire, 
where they played a central role in ordering the world according to European norms and concepts, and museums took on the role of interpreters of culture, uh, both that of Europe and of the many indigenous peoples that they colonize. Um, one thing that I spoke about a lot when discussing colonial mo modes of control is the production of knowledge. Um, and so we can think of the phrase knowledge is power here, um, which helps us understand that the act of producing knowledge is a demonstration of power. And museums very much contributed to this, to producing knowledge um, then in you know, the times of colonialism, and they continue to do so today. Um, and it ultimately too, they perpetuate these narratives um, and histories that are passed off as universal. Um, but at the same time, they're still largely white and Europe centric. Um, and I, I uh, also want to bring in this relatively new organization that was started, Brandy, if you can advance the slide, um, referred to uh, as the death, death to Museums, which is kind of a dramatic call to arms. Um, but, you know, they're addressing this history of museums and its ties with colonialism um, and very blatantly saying at the start in their kind of manifesto, museums are not neutral and never have been. Um, from the beginning, they were built on the systematic destruction of indigenous cultures and history, um, profited off centuries of looting, and continue to reinforce white supremacist and capitalist power structures. Um, and so this is an organization that largely kind of disseminates um, conferences and lectures on YouTube for free. Um, and it was started by three rising museum professionals who really care about you know, creating museums that um, do away with or kind of actively fight these kinds of power structures. Um, and so with that, hopefully that history can kind of frame what our, our conversation, the form our conversation is to take. Okay, so we're actually going to be moving to some our interns participation, which I didn't mention earlier is to um, we've been working in conversation, the four of us so far, um, to draw up some questions and to hear from our students about, you know, their interests in this topic. And so Tess and Uchenna are here um, to share the questions that they've posed to us and helped us to create, you know, our responses to their answer to create this program. So Tess, we're going to go to you because you had a question to start us off. Okay, so when we first started thinking about this program, the first question that popped into mind was, where was this whole idea that museums were neutral? Where did that come from to start? Right. So I'm uh, just going to start by saying, you know, I think it's kind of a little baked in. <laughs> museums, um, when you really look at the missions of museums, um, I think it's, it is sort of a neutral right, to collect, to preserve, to educate. Those are the core sort of baseline activities that pretty much, you know, organizes museums in general. And I do have some specific ones to share. Um, I wanna make sure I have them um, ready, but just as an example, the Metropolitan Museum of Art collects, studies, conserves, and prevents significant works of art across all times and cultures in order to connect people to creativity, knowledge, and ideas. So um, you can see we collect, we study, preserve, you know, present. Um, the Philadelphia Museum of Art, again, museum's mission is to preserve, enhance, interpret, and extend the reach of its great collection, in particular, um, and the visual arts in general. Um, here's one from the Portland Museum of Art. Uh, a little bit more simple, to engage diverse communities through art and film of enduring quality and to collect, preserve, and educate for the enrichment of present and future generations. And lest we um, leave out the Palmer, I wanted to make sure and include the Palmer. I have to admit that the Palmer's is a, a little bit different and something that I took note of when I was looking to um, possibly join the Palmer a couple of years ago, I did notice that they really sort of foregrounded the um, connection with the university. And as it says, to serve as a cultural and scholarly resource for the university and audiences from Pennsylvania, the nation and the world. Through an array of thought provoking exhibitions and multidimensional programs, the Palmer encourages critical thinking, inspires curiosity and creativity, and fosters respect for diverse cultures and points of view. In accordance with the highest professional and ethical standards, the museum preserves and augments the collections it holds in trust for future generations. 
So, um, so I really did like how they foregrounded the educational aspect as a museum educator that um, made me take note. But you can see um, in here the parts about, you know, our purpose is to collect and to hold for future generations um, these items in which we are going to um, educate. So those are, you know, lofty goals, goals for the greater good. They are very neutral. But um, when you really look, kind of take the thread of, you know, what is it that we're collecting, preserving, and how are we educating? So sort of this implication of neutrality is a given in museum's concept of self. Um, but to really think about, you know, who decides what to collect? Um, who decides what is enduring quality? One of these mentioned um, to collect and preserve objects of enduring quality. Whose decision is that what's enduring quality versus what's not? So what is collected, what's presented? Um, we kind of see that those decisions are not um, really neutral, that there is a system, a, excuse me, a system at play here. And um, it's kind of communicated or discussed as far as being best practices, so to speak. And I would say it's actually kind of this web of interacting systems that take place that um, kind of decide what to collect, preserve for the future generations. And that web is made up of kind of a number of threads of um, art education and training programs. So artists are um, participating in learning their craft and what goes into that. Um, what are artists learning? Who are they learning from? Um, also, another thread would be art criticism or journalism, right? What art or exhibitions are judged to be um, of good quality and or meaningful? Who is judging them? Uh, art history also is a major part of this framework. What artwork is selected to be included in textbooks to learn from, to kind of hold up as an exemplar from a certain time period? And um, finally, I would say the art market too is an important sort of piece of this um, web as far as, you know, what is artwork selling? What artwork is selling? How much? You know, what's commanding the attention in the art market? And these um, pieces all come together, I think, to really kind of create those decisions. And then we find when we pull on any one of those threads that um, we really discover that there is a, excuse me, there's not a true neutrality. So when you kind of get to the result of that interlocking is interlocking systems, we find sort of the result, the first thing to look at is the diversity of museum collections. Well, what is it, right, that we are collecting and preserving and, and using as a basis of education? Now, this is a fairly recent study. It was done in 2019 uh, by a team at Williams College that included museum professionals as well as mathematicians and statisticians. So um, they took uh, 18 major U.S. Muse museums, and you can find the list. I don't have it pictured for you here, but so the Met is there, Philadelphia Museum of Art, the Museum of Fine Arts, Boston, uh, LACMA. Um, so it's Detroit Institute of Arts. It's, you know, major museums across the country and um, took their collection as sort of representative and they, you know, um, had the mathematicians and statisticians help to kind of um, do the uh, broader application of those numbers. And this is what um, they find about museum collections in the U.S., what we find in them. The artwork in these collections is represented by um, these makers. So white men are represented as artists of objects 75, more than 75 percent of the time, um, with white women at 10.8 percent coming in second. That's quite a gap between first and second place. <laughs> Asian men at seven and a half percent, Hispanic, Latinx men at 2.6 um, percent, and then all other sort of representations in less than one percent of the collections. So, um, I think we know, even without looking at real data, how that doesn't really compare with our actual national population. Um, I really like these graphics here, so I wanted to include those for you. Uh, there was an artist that created these um, graphics 
I put her name there, Mona Chalabi, that she was inspired by this study to create these graphics to show. The top one is if the women, um, if the museum had visitors, um, the number of visitors that just were representing the number of women artists in the collection. This is how many visitors would be in that museum. So it's quite sparse. And, um, and then the uh, middle one is if it was being visited by the same representation of male artists. But the bottom representation is one that shows if it were to represent our true um, entire population, like how full and busy that museum would be. Um, I did actually go ahead and do uh, the numbers too to kind of show that we have this impression that that wasn't quite right, but this is on the left is not a full population pie chart. It's really only representing the same demographics that were in that study. So, um, but even those to compare how much overrepresentation um, there is uh, from artists that are uh, white men. Um, you can see that the only other group that's sort of comparably represented are Asian men are also more represented in the art museums than they are in the entire population, but every other group is significantly underrepresented. And so, um, you know, this is just when we kind of come to maybe one point of that looking at museum collections uh, about what um, is really, you know, can't, can't possibly truly be neutral um, if it's really skewing the results of what's being collected. So when we kind of discover this, it does make us question, you know, whose history is being prioritized and preserved, um, what culture is being institutionalized and used as the basis for education and enrichment, and, um, and then how relevant that really makes museums for entire audience. You know, as an educator, I'm very much concerned and interested in having, you know, all sorts of people, um, everyone, you know, art is for everyone is one of my little mottos that I enjoy, but, you know, finding that that's not um, really the case and what can we do to kind of help make it the case. Um, I did want to point out that, you know, there have been sort of clues that this inequality has been going on for some time. The Guerrilla Girls is, I think, one of the best known, right, activist groups in the art world. Um, they were founded in 1985. These are some of their more well-known um, pieces that challenged the Met Museum and New York Museums uh, as far as how their um, collections and exhibitions sort of underrepresented female artists. And they also, and more recently have, you know, they branched into trying to help push museums and the art world in general to represent um, women and people of color as well. So, um, you know, you kind of think that it, you would hope that since 1985, there might be a little bit more progress. So it's, I guess, pointing to the fact that we are still in um, a system of, not truly having neutrality, um, even though we think that um, we do and that it's, there's not a system in place or a system of oppression in place. And so once we kind of come to the realization that, you know, um, we've, we've become aware of a situation that's unjust. Um, so if we continue to say that we're neutral when it's clearly pointed out in just very simple stats that I can pull together, you know, in an hour. Um, you know, there's something wrong there to not take action to try uh, and not to take changes to try and fix it. And so I kind of wanted to point to this very famous quote by um, Archbishop Desmond Tutu. I think you all probably heard this before that if you are neutral in situations of injustice, you have chosen the side of the oppressor. And I think that's ap applicable here that if we do try to maintain this, um, you know, uh, belief that museums are neutral, we're really only perpetuating the situation further. And um, I have shared this with uh, in our last sort of docent meeting, so docents who are here are going to recognize this, but a more um, sort of fun way to think about this idea is through our friend Dolly Parton, that as soon as you realize something's a problem, you should fix it. 
don't be a dumbass. I just love that quote. I loved hearing her say it. And um, I agree wholeheartedly that, you know, sometimes we can operate with a naivete um, that might, you know, help support and promote these systems of oppression. Um, uh, you know, that's the best case scenario that we're all operating in this um, sort of naivete. But, um, but once you find out, once it's called your attention, it's really necessary to, um, to start taking action. All right, so that's how, where I think sort of that idea of mentality comes from. Tess, it looks like you had our second question too. I do. For this question, I want to know, how do museums uphold systems of power and oppression? In what ways has the Palmer perpetuated these systems? All right. Well, I think sort of the first answer pointed to that a little bit, right? So I would think this is a good opportunity to um, go into some of the details about how the Palmer in particular kind of participates or, you know, shows up actually in the, our overall cultural system. So I wanted to share with you, we've been doing um, for a while, I will say that, you know, Palmer staff, this is, these are things that we have been aware of and sort of working for, um, towards, you know, changing for a while. Um, and we've assembled these numbers to to talk about and really, really look at lately. So we've had these kind of readily available. There are right now about 9,600 9, objects in the collection. And um, this, the breakdown of the different collecting areas I have here for you on the left, you can see that the strength of the collection is in American art. We also have quite a few um, European works and then um, some considerable Asian works in both ceramics and prints, um, and then smaller numbers of Middle Eastern, African, and then sort of a collection of other sort of cultural works. Um, and of those 9,600 objects, eight to 10% of the collection is represented by female artists. So that's kind of in line with those national numbers, right? That sort of still, um, still matches the national sort of museum collection numbers, but not our national population or even of course our regional population, right? Um, and then African-American artists are represented by about 1% of the collection. So those numbers are, do kind of fall right in line with that study by Williams College um, and that do need to of course be addressed. Um, acquisition methods. I just did want to point out to you something. This is kind of along the lines of the, the thread of the art market kind of being part of um, sort of museum practices. And the acquisition methods, and this is just going from since 2010. Some of our data is we have some um, approximate numbers for you because of our collections database that sometimes doesn't have everything noted. Um, to 100 percent, but um, you can see that about almost 90 percent of the collection came to the Palmer through gifts and bequests. So um, we have there a representation of artwork that came to us from individual collectors, right, from um, people who were able to uh, purchase and collect artwork and then um, pass it on to the museum for greater good. But that does, of course, you know, steer the type of artwork that's collected, interest in art, things like that, um, who, who is able to acquire artwork as well. And the purchase is about almost 9%. And that's something that, you know, is important because a lot of the acquisitions that have been made to address the gaps that we have in the collection, you know, were made through purchases. So those funds there are very important to us as far as helping to, you know, bridge the gaps that we need to, um, that we need to bridge. I think Carrie also has some notes in this section as well and what you'd like to share, kind of talking about museum staff and representation, which I will maybe say to lead you in that, so you don't have to say it, but the, the Palmer, um, does have um, a very uh, non-diverse staff. We are currently all um, white. And um, so that's something that we are conscious of and you know, doing our work to try and you know, supplement our knowledge. Yeah, and to talk, 
to feed into that, I, I want to get into some kind of mu future museum professionals uh, recruiting pipelines that might account for, um, you know, poor representation of our, you know, our diverse country in the museum profession, but also talk a little bit about the impact of art history on the fields of art museums and the kind of educational training of different um, uh, positions within the museum, particularly the curatorial positions, that there has been a trend towards uh, PhDs in art history as, um, you know, joining the curatorial ranks. And one kind of field where, or, or specialization of art history, where that's not necessarily the case is contemporary art, um, that there has been a rise in masters and MFAs, um, as well as masters in things like curatorial studies, new programs are popping up at places like BARD. Um, and elsewhere. But there was this one survey of 100 curators in contemporary art that was done by Artnet um, that I have a, a, a screenshot of here. And only 27% of the 100, so essentially 27 of those curators um, at 69 different museums had PhDs. Um, and as I said, though, this survey doesn't actually account for when those um, curators were hired, that they're you know, interviewing a number of, of big name um, people in the field that didn't necessarily get their jobs a couple of years ago. Um, but the trend is that the, you know, the higher ranking degree you have, the better chance you are to get a curatorial position at a larger museum and particularly, um, you know, an academic museum too, where a lot of uh, curators and other museum staff also teach. Um, you know, our curatorial team teaches classes, you know, occasionally. And um, in addition to this, you know, coming from the discipline of art history, like we need to have a whole separate talk about how art history fits in with these systems of power um, and oppression. So I don't want to get into that, but also just acknowledging that the discipline in which a lot of these museum professionals are coming from um, also is very much entrenched in these same ideas um, that are, you know, European centric um, and uh, largely white. Um, so Brandy, if you can advance the slide to also talk about um, the issue of unpaid internships, which is one thing that I think the Palmer is is great. Um, we have paid internships in the summer. Um, you know, there are new partnerships with community service work study to get students, um, undergraduate students involved in the museum and internships um, throughout the year. We have some interns with us tonight that, um, you know, are part of that. And you know, we're offering internships for credit when um, that's not possible. But a lot of museums are still offering unpaid internships. And the thing that that does is it deters applicants, um, students from lower socioeconomic backgrounds from applying. Because for them, it's more important to pay rent or to be able to buy groceries for the week. So they you know, will take a, you know, a minimum wage job at a Target or you know, a different retailer or a restaurant. Um, in order to be able to make an income uh, because that internship, even though it would provide them with professional experience for a future career, um, it's just not possible with it being unpaid. And so those internships then also um, shrink the size of the applicant pool, which then also chances are it's going to be a lot less diverse, um, right? So you are only going to see applications a lot of the time from applicants who are well off enough um, to be able to work for free. And so there's this fun um, book by Kimberly Drew, who was an art history student at Smith and now is a, a museum professional. She worked at the Met for a little while in social media and other things. She is a curator. She has a great museum presence uh, or um, Instagram presence. Uh, her handle is Museum Mammy. And so I, I recommend checking her out. But this book came out that's um, accessible and it's all of her thoughts about art and largely museums. And there was a passage that struck me as we were putting together this presentation that kind of really encapsulated um, my ideas about unpaid internships. And so she wrote, quote, I confidently applied to the Studio Museum because its internship was paid. It's absurd to think about how a $1,600 stipend changed the course of my life. It's absurd to think about how many internships are still unpaid and how elitist and morally corrupt it is to hire unpaid labor. Um, she then says, I wonder how many young people don't apply to internships because they are unpaid, right? Um, and so I think museums are starting to recognize this and change it. I know um, AAM, the Association um, of Museums, 
um, of American museums came out, I think a year ago, you know, saying that, you know, museums need to start offering paid internships. The Metropolitan Museum of Art received a, a large donation recently and said that that money is going to go towards um, paying all future interns. Um, whereas they used to have some internships that were for credit when they couldn't offer payment. But um, I think the thing about this is we want our future museum professionals to get this experience young while they're in school. Um, and as long as we're not paying them, um, it's really limiting who we can actually bring into the fold. Yes. And I do want to just be clear. I think these are all very valid, you know, kind of reasons why the museum field overall is populated by rather undiverse um, population. But um, I am kind of proud that the Palmer has these paid internships available. It's something that was in place before I got here and I was very happy to see them in place. So uh, special thanks to you know, those previous staff members who worked hard and our um, development team who's worked hard to put those funding in place to have that available. It's something that we would love to increase. As Carrie mentioned, the paid internships that we have available operate during the summer and um, primarily historically were um, sort of awarded to maybe seniors, upper level undergraduates or graduate students and working in projects with the museum. When I came into the Palmer, we did begin, I did begin instituting undergraduate internships because I feel that there is um, an opportunity for undergraduates that, you know, it's really part of their academic experience to get some, some experience. And there were many students interested in finding out more about museums and if it was a field they were interested in going into. Um, and, you know, frankly, I did have to begin them with um, unpaid, you know, funds because uh, those summer funds didn't go farther. Um, but we, like Carrie mentioned, have entered a partnership that I'm um, very grateful for that helps some students be able to be paid for the internships and working for uh, working with us. And also we have made sure that students are, you know, pursuing uh, course credit perhaps so that that helps them in their academic career. So really trying to find other ways um, to help, you know, further them without it being completely unpaid, but it's still something that um, we could, we're definitely continuing to look for more funding to support these. All right. And um, so our question was about, right, how museums get the technology. Yeah. yeah, and so in addition to just these larger systemic issues with museums, um, Tess really wanted us to get into different things that the, the Palmer possibly has done that, you know, participated in that or perpetuated those systems. And so for the sake of transparency and kind of critical self-reflection, we're going to share um, two recent instances um, where the Palmer as an institution was complicit in perpetuating these systems of power. Um, and so both instances relate to larger trends among museums. So I'll begin by providing a little bit of context about each um, before getting into a specific discussion of uh, the actions of the Palmer. And so the first relates to exhibition practices surrounding the display and presentation of objects made by people who are black, indigenous, or people of color. Um, and the issues that arise are, are complex, they're multiple, um, ranging from the insensitive display of objects, including ones that were looted, to the primitivizing of cultures through exhibition design, um, and the framing of exhibitions around the powerful collectors of objects, um, those collectors who are largely white, rather than the objects themselves or their makers. Um, and so this last point is the one that uh, about framing exhibitions around collectors is what I want to delve into a bit. Um, it happens time and again, um, like in the ongoing exhibition um, at the Met, which we just had on our slide, Art of Native America, um, the Charles and Valerie Diker collection. Um, and that exhibition has received quite a bit of backlash. It's still on view, um, largely from an advocacy group, um, the uh, Association Sorry. on American Indian Affairs. Um, and they denounced the, the display of the exhibition basis, uh, on the basis of ethical grounds. Um, and so they were saying that a lot of the objects, one, are not art, um, that they are ceremonial or funerary in their function and belong in original communities. Um, and that they likely only ended up in a private collection in the first place based off of trafficking or through looting. 
Um, they also made claims that um, because the objects in the exhibition, even though they were promised gifts to the Metropolitan, meaning they will end up there eventually, um, promised gifts are not subject to current laws that are in place like the Native American Graves and Protection um, and Repatriation Act from 1990, um, which is a law that requires museums to uh, that receive museums that receive funds from the government to have their collections of Native American objects and human remains inventoried and then to allow members from um, different tribes the right to repatriation, right, to ask for those objects back. Um, and that law only applies to objects in the collection. And because these are not quite yet there, um, it kind of circumvents that law. Um, and they had a, a, a bunch of other complaints, largely one that um, tribal leaders were not consulted on how to respectfully display these objects or the way to label them too. Um, and the idea too, that you have the names of the collectors, you know, largely as um, signaling that they are a part of the exhibition um, rather than really just foregrounding the objects themselves. Um, and so this is what relates us to, uh, to the Palmer. Um, we had a recent exhibition of African art um, in the spring of 2019 and it represented objects from cultural groups throughout continental Africa. Um, a wide array, sculptural objects, there were textiles um, and uh, the objects are, are great to learn from. It was you know amazing that we were able to have them on display. However, the exhibition really centered the narrative of the white collector. Um, it you know we had video interviews with the collector. It was in the, you know, title in our intro panel to, you know, frame the show. Some of the organizing principles are, you know, where the collector visited in his time as an ambassador. Um, and, you know, in several discussions that I've had with student, you know, um, volunteers and interns that I was working with last spring um, through our Palmer Student Ambassador Program, you know, after we got a tour of the exhibition so that we could plan an Art After Hours event to go along with it, um, you know, there were a lot of conversations of like, this doesn't feel right. Um, you know, why are we talking about um, this one collector? Why aren't we focusing on these objects or arranging them in a different way, framing them in a different way? Um, why are we foregrounding this maybe as the most important part of the exhibition? Um, and so we kind of wanted to bring this up as possibly an example of, you know, the Palmer perpetuating these systems and something that we can definitely learn from, but right, we have to address it first. Um, and a second instance uh, more so involves tokenism and recent um, performances of allyship on social media in the wake of the murder of George Floyd and so many other black Americans. Um, so in the days following his murder, many museums shared out posts containing images of works by black artists in their collections. Um, one of the artists whose work was shared at a high rate was Glenn Ligon. Um, who's a black conceptual artist um, whose work explores cultural and social identity through found sources. So things like text and novels, um, photographs. Um, and he also uses some unexpected materials like coal dust, which is featured in, in the work at the Palmer. Um, the Metropolitan Museum again was one such museum that used one of Glenn Ligon's works. Um, I feel most colored when I'm thrown against a sharp white background to illustrate a letter from the museum's director about his response to the murder of George Floyd um, and you know, what the museum can do. Uh, shortly after that, um, Ligon took to social media, calling out the Met on Instagram um, and other institutions that use his work and that of other black artists like Faith Ringgold, who was also mentioned in the Met letter. Um, like the Met, the Palmer social media post following um, the death of George Floyd, similarly included a, an image of a work by Glenn Ligon that is in our collection, um, untitled Crowd, The Fire Next Time, that features a quote by James Baldwin in Coal Crystals over an image from the Million Man March in DC in 1995. Um, and this one, when we were putting together this talk really came to mind because I was one of the, the, the people that suggested this work to go along with the post. Um, and so, you know, this is something that we need to think about in terms of, is this, you know, is this just a symbolic gesture? Is it a case of performative allyship? Um, you know, what are actually the concrete things that we are trying to do as a museum to, to bring about change? Um, and so, you know, we need to, to think about this moving forward. 
Um, and so I think Brandy might have a little bit of a, a closing statement to kind of round this out. So, um, sorry, Carrie, I think we had this too, which I think oh. we've kind of covered yeah. already. And so I should have put that first. <laughs> <laughs> I do want to share a statement. I'm actually um, wanting to pivot to the next question where I've, I think that the, um, the statement really kind of, these ideas kind of encapsulate why we're sharing them. And um, we're kind of are getting ahead and behind um, our students' participation and their questions. But um, we are including these discussions and really kind of, uh, you know, laying bare the things that as we are doing deep reflection that we're finding, um, yeah, you know, we've made some uh, missteps, you know, and things that we can recognize that we need to move forward, you know, with in a different way. So, um, you know, having a diverse team, having multiple voices, you know, come together as part of the Palmer team is really important and we recognize that in kind of trying to reflect and move forward. At that point, I think we're gonna, um, yeah, bring in Uchenna's question and um, are you set to share your question? Um, before we get to my question, someone in the audience wanted to know whether or not um, language such as like using tribe instead of cultural groups or something, would that be an example of like language stigmatizing artworks from other countries? And I feel like that's kind of relevant to the link to the conversation we've been having about like framing and such. Yes, so. I think that's a very good question. And someone's being very, um, the, the person who posed that question is, you know, being very astute. I do believe, you know, museums have um, overall, previously kind of dispelled the use of the word tribe as far as referring to African cultures and ethnicities um, in the African art. I know that that's something that at least a decade or so ago, museums were having that conversation about this is an outmoded and pejorative term, and that it kind of got changed um, kind of throughout the field. So, you know, you can see that museums are dealing with these issues and making changes. Um, there is kind of a slowness to museum fields overall making changes. But I think there's a current conversation um, and, you know, those changes are being incorporated too to kind of change the term slave um, to enslaved people so that we're not sort of denoting that that's, you know, that enslavement describes that whole person's, you know, being in existence that that was more of a uh, condition that was you know forced upon them so so those kind of ideas about language are important and we recognize that they're important um, and so that is something that I think museums have been participating in and have been you know fairly adept at uh, um, you know adjusting to throughout time so I think that was a good a good note from someone in our yeah, audience. Brandy, can I acknowledge too that um... Uh, there are groups of different Native American peoples that reclaim that that term tribe yes, and use you. that. Um, and so, as Bernie was pointing, it is very it's specific to the you know cultural groups and peoples that you're referring. Um, that we use the term tribe in describing different Native American peoples, but we do not in describing different African cultural groups um, throughout the continent. So yes, just exactly. That. Thanks for throwing that in. Uchenna, share with us your thinking on um, this question that you helped us tackle. Um, yeah, so I was kind of thinking about how like we've already pointed out like why museums aren't neutral and how um, the Palmer has made some mistakes in the past. So now I'm wondering what the Palmer has done to bring about change and what are some concrete steps that the Palmer has taken to be more inclusive and kind of correct those past mistakes. Okay, thank you. All right, so this, um, I do want to share this note by our esteemed director, Erin Koh. She's with us tonight. Thanks for joining us, Erin, and for kind of providing these thoughts and guidance. And, you know, we have, like I've mentioned, you know, this isn't new for us to kind of be wrestling with some of these issues, but just with the entire sort of sea of cultural change and a shift in awareness, I think we too as museum professionals are really wrestling with this. And so um, I'll get into some specifics uh, in a moment, but I wanted to share these thoughts with you from Aaron because I think they greatly encapsulate both kind of what, we're, what we are doing, 
to answer Uchenna's prompt here, but also kind of reflect on those things that we shared about the couple of particular instances of um, of missteps that we've recently um, taken. So the museum is going through a process of self-reflection in order to bring about meaningful change. This process entails institutional and personal awareness and transparency by acknowledging how we have supported systems of power by privileging white collections, collectors, as in the example of African brilliance, and for that for that matter, white artists and performative gestures of allyship as exemplified by the Ligon Post. Those are relevant examples. We learn from failure and openly acknowledge that the journey to equity, inclusion, and anti-racism is one that will not be accomplished by a single exhibition or an Instagram post. And even statements of solidarity only scratch the surface of the longstanding problems of racism and inequality that have historically plagued cultural institutions like the Palmer. We are seeking tangible and sustainable stru structural changes that address issues of e equity, diversity, inclusion, and anti-racism. And tonight's event is a critical, critical step in that journey. So I wanted to share that with you all because it, this is, you know, we're beginning that process, and um, you know, we've already, we already be started it with um, different changes, as I've mentioned about collecting areas and things like that. But with this new focus, we really kind of want to put much more energy and focused energy towards what we can do about making changes. Some of the things that we've done in the past, as I have kind of alluded to, is in the area of collections. I know our curator of contemporary art, now our assistant director, Joyce Robinson, very purposely made some acquisitions um, throughout the 2000s and in into the last decade as well, because she was conscious of the gap of um, not having the representation of African American artists. And so she did make very conscious um, acquisitions that helped address those. Um, the Renee Stout on the left is permanently on view. Well, maybe permanently is not the correct word, I'm sorry. It has been on view for the entire time I've been at the museum, which is lovely. Um, and this um, lovely Radcliffe ba Bailey print is, um, not currently on view, but maybe coming soon. So those are just a couple of examples. There are other works as well. Of course, we still have work to do, as mentioned, you know, in our collection stats, but it is something that has been in the awareness for a while and that, you know, we have been taking steps towards. Also, um, wanting to have a variety of exhibition programs that will interest you know, a wide variety of audiences, age, um, interests, community, um, et cetera. And, you know, seeing that, you know, works by African-American artists and sort of um, promoting um, their work as well kind of helps fill that gap in the collection. The Song of Myself is uh, slightly earlier. Um, I think in the early 2000s, and you can see that featured the Radcliffe Bailey that I just showed. Those are works from the permanent collection. The Augusta Savage exhibition and the John Biggers exhibition were recent over the last year, and um, the past year, you know, was something that we really um, were interested in focusing on, bringing those artists, you know, out as um, really celebrating their importance in the world of art history and art education. So you know, this is something that, of course, like I mentioned with others, continues to be a focus and an interest of ours. Um, I also want to mention that interpretation in the galleries, um, I think we're at a point where interpretation in museum, in the museum field overall is sort of um, continuing to evolve, but I wanted to point out that our curator of American art, Adam Thomas, is, um, I've been really impressed since I've been here with how he addresses issues in labels, that he really kind of addresses things head on and doesn't shy away or try to make things seem, um, you know, not a problem. So this is just a, an excerpt from one example of this work by Thorpe in which Adam has really kind of called out these stereotypical caricatured images of African Americans that are contained in this um, in this painting. So uh, there are other examples of this in the gallery and I you know I think that is a good thing that we're not sort of trying to hide issues from art history but really foregrounding them and saying you know this this is here. Um, I think that's important. And with our programs as well, we, you know, have um, 
really wanted to increase the input from our visitors, for lack of a better word, but I've really brought the shared inquiry type of, sort of tours and programs because that in itself already kind of breaks down the museum authority and democratizes the art experience to where our visitors don't come into the museum. You know, I really don't want them to come in and get this feeling like I have to hear from the museum authority what I need to think about this artwork because art can be experienced individually and personally. And so one of the main things, you know, my goal of programs is to help visitors kind of to guide their personal experience and to kind of bring them into the fold and let them know that they have all the experience and knowledge kind of that they need to interact with artwork. So, you know, trying to break down those barriers. Um, and also, uh, you know, breaking into our students, really tapping into uh, the university and academic program here and bringing students into the fold as volunteers and interns is a way to incorporate, you know, their voice and experience and their interests in our programs. And that's been a really important um, focus of mine since I've been here. What else? I also want to share with you that these are um, a little bit more recent uh, projects, but it's something that we actually had been talking about for a longer time. And, you know, we got a push during this past summer uh, to go ahead and start really um, using advisory committees uh, and our strategic planning, working with partners more to bring audience members, community members into the fold so that they're actually, we're actually reaching out for partnership in developing exhibition concepts to find out, you know, what do people uh, want? What do they want to see? What are their interests? So that, again, that kind of goes back to that idea of democratizing the experience and, um, and really being responsive and being an inclusive museum. So we currently have two fairly new committees formed. One is around equity, diversity, inclusion, and anti-racism, and a group of about 15 um, leaders in the community at the university have generously agreed to serve and meet with us um, a few times over the course of this year to address our a strategic plan that's specifically about action around equity, diversity, inclusion, and anti-racism. I included a screenshot there. That's not actually the full plan, but um, I wanted to give you an idea that we do have, you know, a plan that's in the works with changes coming that have, that will be, you know, addressing staffing issues, um, diversity and inclusion volunteers, and collaborations, you know, how we're really working with the community. Um, and um, our other committee that we recently started hasn't actually met yet, but will be our first exhibition planning committee, as I mentioned, sort of bringing audience members and partners into the fold early so that we really have that partnership um, across the board in development. And that particular exhibition group will be working with us on developing our 50th anniversary exhibition that will debut in a couple of years. And so um, we thought, thought that was a very fitting exhibition to begin sort of our new, our new planning process with them. Ah, so um, those are some of the particular, you know, steps that we've taken to address some of these needs. So Chana, you have the next question you can see as well. Share with us your thoughts. Yeah, so like now that you've kind of like laid out the steps that the Palmer is taking for like in including more diverse voices, like how specifically how are voices being um, uplifted at the Palmer currently? Sure. All right, I'm gonna, let's see. I think I have a brief um, just overview for this in that I figured with our earlier stack of topics, we might be running short on time, but kind of calling back to some of those projects that um, we have been working on and that is sort of a new focus of really looking carefully at our exhibition and programming plans to, um, to really address and uplift these um, voices of color, foreground um, artists, 
um, collaborators such as guest curators and educators as well to kind of um, work with us in the interim before you know our staff is able to grow to incorporate um, to incorporate more voices. Um, also the partnerships and advisory committee is um, we're really kind of looking to like I said take it out of just the Palmer planning team and expand the voices that are going into those exhibitions and programming planning. Um, I also mentioned that incorporating student voices. I, I thought in particular I should mention Art After Hours, this program, you know, is a program that we do live and we'll continue once we're back in the museum to do live and um, really featuring our students and all of their you know varying experiences and interests in those programs as well and you can see evidence of that from the virtual programs that we've been um, working on is there um, i invite you to if there's some um, particular thoughts that you had to sh uh, around this question to kind of share those as well Luchena. but we do have i think one last question that you posed yeah, so I just wanted to know like what other institutions we could look to as an example that have been able to like make these changes in Oh no. I'm gonna go ahead and kind of get to my answer on that. Uchen, are you back? Oh you're back. Good. Oh, did I cut out? You did cut out. Sorry. Um, I was just wondering what institutions we can look to as an example as we um, move forward in this sure. um, path. Well, um, I would say that at the Palmer, we're kind of talking about these resources. And it's interesting to note that there's not really um, a single institution to point to in answering. And I think that, that the reason why is because this is a museum-wide, sort of a field-wide um, issue that we are all kind of grappling with and trying to make changes at the same time. Um, and, you know, there may be some developments at one, different developments at another that we kind of notice. Uh, I wanted to share these with you. These are sites that I've, uh, groups that we've found ourselves, you know, reading articles for, and I recognize that they're doing a lot of good work. So I wanted to kind of mention them here. Um, Mass Action, this museum, it's sort of um, more of a consortium of museum professionals that gathered together. They actually started by gathering together in the in-between sessions of a conference to, ha to start these conversations about social action in museums. And so that formed into its own group. And they are doing kind of great work um, writing, uh, providing tools and resources to other museums. So that's actually a really great resource. And the Inclusium is a site that is a web-based site only, um, but that does also offer a lot of uh, resources, readings, materials, and toolkits around building a more inclusive museum. Um, the Talking About Race by the Smithsonian Museum, that's a website that they released this summer. I think they released it a little bit earlier than um, they had anticipated, but it was just the right time. They released it over the summer, seeing kind of the need and interest. And so that is actually a very helpful toolkit. And I think like everybody, um, we're also doing individual reading and growth, uh, looking individually for resources to help us kind of address our shortcomings. Um, Tess. Yeah, so my last question, we actually have a few questions in the chat okay. that we could get to. Um, one person asked, in this space of discussing institutional self-reflection, um, how do 21st century museums, including the Palmer, engage with social media as a space for discourse about power, given the publicized problematic corporate culture, undermining of democracy, and racist algorithm algorithms and social media platforms? Mm. I think that's... Not sure I got that all in my head. That's a big one. Basically, I think they're asking how the Palmer uses their social media as a space to not be neutral. Right. Um, <clears throat> I would say that the Palmer um, is currently, as a social media space, is more about 
sort of communication and um, promotion of the arts in general, um, and also like communicating with audiences. That right now I would say that it's not, um, that we're not on the front lines of pushing for social action through our social media. Um, and I might say that it probably has to do with, you know, our staff numbers and kind of being um, uh, where we are and having one, you know, having a person do that as, you know, a portion of their responsibility. So um, I think that as we continue to look at our actions that we're taking towards change and um, inclusion, diversity, that that's something that is, you're going to kind of probably see some evolution in our social media strategy as well. But I, I can't point to anything specific. I know that um, we have foregrounded, you know, African American artists as well, but we've talked about that as being, you know, sometimes it's on and sometimes it's not quite the right thing. So. Mm -hmm. There was also another question that says, does the Palmer know which Native American group or groups own the land the university was built upon? Are there plans to feature exhibitions or voices of those groups in the Palmer galleries? That's a good question and something of interest right now, I know. Um, on our exhibition calendar right now, we have a couple of years on the calendar before we are to move to a new museum and uh, a new museum building. And the exhibitions that are on our calendar don't include that right now, but after you know we're actually starting to work on on that exhibition schedule in the new museum so the exhibitions that are in the current building have kind of been set for a little while and we are kind of wide open and since we're starting this process of bringing in um, audience voices interests and things like that it's a perfect time to kind of hear this idea and request mm -hmm. so i think it's great to share those thoughts here thank you I see joyce answered in the chat and said it was the susquehanna um, Indians. Oh, were. good. Thank you, Joyce, who's lived in Pennsylvania much longer than I have. <laughs> I could have answered that for Gainesville, <laughs> Florida. All right, any others that you want to share? I think this last question that you posed to us in preparation for the talk was, I think, an interesting one. And I will say before we get to it that we are kind of getting over time, so we'll kind of answer this quickly. And I'll remind you all that we've got a, a sticker party that we you know we want to get to and uh, um i will soon put that chat i uh, put that uh link in the chat as we're kind of talking next yep so my last question was how can patrons and visitors hold museums accountable when there are situations of injustice or they see something not right with the museums and how their practice is going yeah carrie did you want to start with that ah yeah if you could advance the slide so i have um three ideas for how you know visitors and because we're a university museum largely students university community and our local community can get involved um, and actually hold the museum accountable um, the first one has to do with financial resources which really limits um you know who can actually hold the museum accountable but um uh, money is power and museums rely on funding. Um, one way that students could exert um, this would be to leverage their student organizations that they're a part of and, you know, co-sponsor events with the museum using UPAC funds, the University Park Allocations Committee. Um, and so that's, you know, that's a mode of funding. Um, you can also become a member, um, which is another way. And for students, membership to the Palmer is free. Um, when you're a member, you're more kind of on the inside in terms of information that's disseminated about events. You're the first one to hear about it, upcoming exhibitions. Um, and, you know, that's that's a great way to get involved and to, you know, exercise your, your right. Um, and finally, to speak up. Um, and you can do this in multiple ways. You can write and call museum staff. Um, you can find out who is on the museum board and contact them. Um, you can volunteer your time if you have some. Um, as students, you can, you know, become a part of our internship uh, program um, or the Palmer Student Ambassadors, which is a, a volunteer um, group as well that help to plan things like Art After Hours. 
um, but apply for internships for, you know, community service work study for the Palmer, um, internships in the summer, and just never be afraid to actually call out um, issues when you see them, because that's, that's the only way things are going to change. Thanks for covering that. All right, any other questions from the 